Okay, but we don't want to do that yet. Okay, sorry. What do I need I'm to gonna, do something? To... I'm gonna. <laughs> What did I do? I closed it, didn't I? Darn it. Okay, I gotta start. I'm done. Somebody's in there as my cell. Excuse me. Everyone, somebody's listed as Greg Noonan. I don't know how we did that, but you're not on mute. So um, if that's you, mute yourself, please. It's got to be one of the panelists or organizers.
Well, good morning, everyone. This is Greg Noonan at Central Region Headquarters. Um, I'm going to pass it over to our two presenters today, uh, Fred Glass and Ron Donovan. Um, I believe Fred is up first. So, uh, Fred, if you'd like to go ahead. Okay, thanks, Greg. Okay, um, the TWIB team was organized back in early um, of 2016, and one of the things that we wanted to do was go back and look at some of the unworn tornado events that had occurred uh, in recent years. We decided to choose uh, 2014 and 2015 because they were the most current uh, data that we had available to us, and they also um, leveraged um, the years that sales became available. So this is going to be just the general outline of the presentation that we're going to follow. Um, I'm going to pretty much do this section one, talking about the tornado statistics and some of the radar attributes. Um, the purpose of the mo and motivation uh, behind us wanting to do this is, uh, again, we wanted to look at the unwarned and par par partially warned events across the central region for these two years. We wanted to see if there were any common elements that might have shown up uh, or factors that might have contributed to the lack of an advance warning um, in order to, to do a real thorough uh, diagnosis of each unwarned tornado, you, there's many more factors that can, uh, can be a part of that process. Um, those we, we couldn't measure, so we're just looking at these in a, a real general sense. Um, and the goal of, of the results of this was to see if there were any uh, training needs that, that stuck out and then hopefully minimize uh, the events um, and improve future warning operations. So this is our methodology that we followed. Uh, the tornado tracks and information that we got from the tornadoes came from stored it, storm data, the NWS performance verification web, website. Um, there was a large number of tornadoes. Uh, we went through uh, extensive QC of, of the database, um, and there's different uh, parts of the presentation that had uh, varying degrees of QC to it. Um, in general, the storm data is, uh, is tracked by uh, county segments. So we merged all those together to get complete tornado tracks. And what we ended up with, with was 447 unwarned tornado cases. And we're gonna look at the distribution of those cases by EF scale, path length and width, duration, time of day and month. Uh, we're also gonna examine any potential external factors that might've impacted the warning decision-making process such as was there a convective watch in effect or were there prior, prior tornadoes uh, on that day or was it the first tornado of the day? Um, the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna dig down a little bit deeper and look at the WSR88D data. And we're gonna look at that at, at the closest uh, radar to the, uh, the storm that produced the tornado. We're gonna look at the convective modes. We're gonna look at some of the storm attributes such as the low level uh, rotation of velocity and uh, uh, normalized rotation magnitude from uh, GR2 analyst of the parent circulation in, our, in mesovortex. Uh, we're gonna look at whether there was a TDS present and the role of uh, potentially any cell mergers on tornado genesis. Um, all the cases are gonna be stratified by convective mode. Uh, we're gonna look at the distribution of that mode, uh, the geographical distribution, EF scale and the mesocycle and the mesovortex characteristics. And then finally, we're gonna just look at whether or not sales was being used uh, during the cases. So we'll start right off with um, the EF scale distribution of these 447 uh, tornado cases. Uh, and the great thing about it is of the 447 tornado cases, 97 were weak. Uh, I think we'll all agree if, if uh, we're gonna have unwarned events, we want them to fall on in, in this scale. Obviously, um, most of us are perfectionists and we'd rather not have any unwarned tornadoes, but if, if we're gonna have some, this is definitely where we want the, the maximum number to fall is, is in the weak category. Uh, there was only a, a few uh, strong tornadoes yep. and there were no violent tornadoes during that two year period that were unwarned. Looking at the monthly distribution, not, nothing um, real earth shattering here. The, the peak of the unworn tornadoes occurred from the late spring into the early summer, pretty much when we see our, our maximum um, in the central US anyway. The hourly distribution pretty much followed that same thing, uh, a max uh, during the late afternoon and into the early evening when we saw our most unworn tornadoes. As far as the tornadoes themselves, uh, we, we did some um, statistics looking at um, the, uh, 
the path length, width, the duration, and these are presented in a, a box and whisker. Uh, the, the very top value is, is the maximum observed and the, the bottom is the minimum and then the 25th and, and, and 75th percentiles in the median. Um, the median value of the path length was one mile and the uh, median value of the path width was 50 yards. As far as duration goes, the, the median duration was approximately three minutes. We don't track tornadoes in terms of minutes and seconds. I don't think we have that ability to do that, but we sure, certainly don't keep the statistics on that. So again, the good thing about it is most of these unworn tornadoes were short-lived uh, and narrow with the median path width of one mile, path, uh, median path width of 50 yards and a lifespan of somewhere around three minutes or so. So looking at some of those possible external factors, we wanted to look to see if there was any type of watch in effect um, there were no watches in effect during 41% of the unworn uh, cases. 59% of the unworn cases had some time, type of watch in effect. 36% of those were tornado watches and 23% were severe thunderstorm watches. Looking at the first tornado of the day, the unworn tornado was the first tornado of the day uh, in 54% of the cases. Um, looking at whether or not it was the only tornado of the day. It was the only tornado of the day in 28% of the cases. So again, uh, the first and only tornado of the day, it was 28% of the cases of the 447, where it was the first tornado and the only tornado of the day. So um, for, for that time, it was the first tornado of the day. Was there a watch in effect? Um, there were no watches in effect for over half the cases when the unworn tornado was the first tornado of the day. And when the unworn tornado was the only tornado of the day, um, there no, were no watches in effect for 62% of the cases. Digging into the radar analysis. So we originally had this 447 unworn cases. Um, we had to do some QC before we could do some of the initial radar analysis. We removed cases where there was no radar data available. Um, we removed cases where the radar data was range folded or, or cases where there was really poor or bad data quality that prevented our ability to determine the convective mode or some of the other uh, radar attributes. Uh, cumulatively, this QC process removed 37 additional cases, reducing the total of the 410 so that we could uh, classify them as far as the convective mode and, and then some other distribution related statistics. This is the uh, scheme that we used to classify the tornadoes. It, it's a little, little bit different than uh, what SPC had done. It follows a, a, a similar study that I had done back in the early 2011-12 uh, period here at St. Louis. Um, these maps here are to scale, so th that would be what we would classify as a, a supercell, a mini or low top supercell on the right diagram, um, a QLCS in the left, a BOECO in the right, um, what we call the multi-cell li line segment. Um, the difference in that and the QLCS is it just didn't meet the, um, the criteria to qualify as a QLCS in terms of length and also uh, the magnitude of the reflectivities and what we call the multi-cell cluster. And then finally, um, getting into the un more unorganized modes, a single cell or something that might have been associated with a, a, a boundary collision or a, a land spout process. So this is the distribution of all the unworn, the 410 unworn tornado cases by these, uh, these modes. And we can see that um, the dominant ones were uh, supercells and QLCSs, the dominant modes producing these. So then what I wanted to do is I, I wanted to kind of group some of these, uh, these uh, modes together into a, a more similar category. Um, so I took the supercells and the low top or mini supercells and grouped them into a category called supercells. I took the QLCSs and the, the Bow Echoes and the uh, multi-cell linear cases and grouped them into a class called linear 
multi-cell cluster stayed by itself. Then we had an, an organized group, which again was that boundary, Lance Bout, and a single case. Uh, that allowed to just have a, a larger number of cases and do maybe a little bit more robust statistics. So what we ended up seeing is again, uh, all the, the supercell modes uh, dominated just slightly the number of um, unworn cases and the linear modes uh, were just a little bit behind that. So organized modes, and again, that's the multi-cell linear modes and supercell modes, they accounted for 86% of all the tornadoes. So 14% of the unworn tornadoes occurred with these um, single boundary land spout cases or unorganized modes. So if we look at a di uh, geographical distribution uh, of these by the mode, um, there's a lot on this map, it's for 410 cases. There's a plot there that shows all the, the different modes and they're color coded. If we look it down uh, and break it down by um, the unorganized cases, what we see is the unorganized cases were most common in, in the Plains region and less common as you get out towards the uh, eastern part of the uh, center region. Then as we look at that, um, those linear and um, the supercell modes and the, the multi-cell cluster, um, the more organ the organized modes, um, what we see is, and in, in, in the supercell modes are in a red or a pink shading, and the linear modes are in this bluish shading. You can see a clear preference for these linear type modes out across the mid Mississippi Valley uh, region and through the Great Lakes and in the Ohio Valley. So while overall supercell modes do dominated the unworn cases, there was a clear preference for the linear modes to be more common in the mid-Mississippi Valley or the Mississippi Valley region east of the Ohio Valley, and then the supercell modes be more common for the unworn tornado cases out across the plains. If we break down the um, EF scale distribution by convective mode, um, what we saw was the, e the tornadoes rated EF0 actually dominated the unworn tornadoes produced by the supercell supercell modes here. Um, whereas in the linear modes, the, the EF1 tornadoes uh, were the most frequently observed unworn tornadoes. And then looking at the un, uh, unwarned um, tornadoes with the, the unorganized events, um, they were dominated by uh, EF0. And I, I don't think that's any, anything earth shattering right there. So the, the last step here in the radar analysis was we wanted to look at a, a little bit more robust look at, at some of the attributes from the radar data. Um, we wanted to look at things like the uh, rotational velocity magnitude of the mesocyclone or, or, or mesovortex associated with it. Um, again, the presence of a TDS, things like that. Um, we had to do another level of QC on this one. And what we wanted to do is, is also just look at the organized convective modes. We wanted to get rid of the, the single and the boundary land spout cases because for the most part, the, there was no identifiable uh, features in the radar data for the vast majority of those cases. So we removed all those single and, ba single and boundary land spout cases. That was 59 cases. We also set a threshold where the lowest uh, rotation of velocity um, that we uh, measured could be 10 knots, and that's equivalent to the NSSL MDA strength rank one. Um, and we removed any cases that uh, all the V sub R values didn't meet this criteria. That only re uh, resulted in removing two cases. Then we removed any cases where the velocity data showed no discernible rotation, and that was nine cases. Um, as far as uh, when we put together statistics for normalized rotation, we set the lowest value um, to normalized rotation at, at 0.26. And, and just a comment on the normalized rotation, we went with just the default settings um, that are available in GR2. We didn't attempt to make any changes to any of the um, adaptable parameters within the normalized rotation that you can. Um, so this left a total of 340 cases, uh, which lent themselves to more robust radar analysis. So roughly three-fourths of the original 447, we could do um, some more robust statistics. Um, if we look at the uh, tornado location versus radar range, what we found was roughly three-fourths of them were inside 60 nautical miles. The median um, distance from the radar was uh, 42 nautical miles, and uh, the median 
radar beam height, the center of the radar beam feet above radar level is just over 3,000 feet. So what, what we ended up doing was we, we looked at the V sub R magnitude of the mesocyclone or the mesovortex for um, the time nearest to the tornado. That would be this rightmost plot, what we call V sub R T. And then we wanted to look at it, um, the previous three volume scans. Now, those volume scans could have ranged anywhere in time from maybe just less than two minutes to up to four and a half minutes, depending on whether or not um, sales was running and then what, what version of meso sales was running. What we see here looking at, at the supercells is that um, there's a, first of all, a, a pretty large range if you look from the, the minimum to the maximum, but also if you look at the box, there's a, a, a pretty decent range from um, the 25th to the 75th percentile. But the, the general trend in, in the median and even in the, in the boxes is also that the rotational velocities are increasing as you head up to tornado time for the 125 supercell cases. The normalized rotation pretty much showed the same exact uh, trends, increasing values of normalized rotation as you head towards tornado time. But again, a, a, a large range in values from that box and the, and the max min as well. We, Looking at the low top supercells themselves, I, I broke those out because they would definitely, if I had incorporated them in that supercell group, would, it, would have resulted in a diminishing of the overall rotational velocity magnitudes. Um, what you see here is there, there's not quite as large a, a range of values, but you see that same uh, general trend in the median value of increasing uh, values of, of V sub R right up to the tornado time, um, but quite a bit lower than the ones for just the regular supercell grouping. For the um, normalized rotation, again, the, the same general trends in the output. So then if we look at the linear modes and then re and refresh in your memory, the linear modes would be the QLCSs, um, the multi-cell uh, line segments, and the uh, bow echo. Um, what we saw is, uh, again, a, a lot of similarities from the supercell grouping, a, a, a very big range from the, the min to the maximum ever observed and even looking at the, at the box plots. Um, but the same thing, and overall an increasing trend of the magnitude of, of, of rotation up till the time of tornado. The same general thing also with the normalized rotation. If you look at the mean and, and, and the box plots is again a, a trend of increasing values. But again, big, big ranges, and, and that's something to really take note of is the big ranges, not only in the min and the max, but also the boxes themselves. Um, the multi-cell cluster, um, not, not quite as the same range, but the trend remains the same looking at the median values increasing right up to uh, tornado time as far as the values in, in the box plots and, and lower values than we saw for both the supercells and for the, um, the linear modes, uh, m more closely to those that we would see with the, the low top or mini supercells. For the multi-cell cluster, um, what we saw um, for the normalized uh, rotation magnitudes, uh, again, that same increasing trend of the normalized rotation values up until the time of tornado. So if we look at just at the, uh, the, tor the V sub R at nearest tornado time, this is all the modes on, on the same plot. What we see is the supercells had the, the highest value. Um, the linear case is just a little bit less. Um, and again, the, the low top having the lowest median value uh, with the multi-cell cluster not far behind it. And again, big ranges in, in the min, min and the max. The same general trend with uh, the uh, normalized rotation. Um, the interesting thing on this one was, is that if you look at the actual values of, of normalized rotation, um, the normalized rotation, the median value was actually higher than uh, that uh, for the supercells. And um, that appears to be a function of the, um, 
the mesocyclone or the mesovortex diameter. And these were the, uh, the diameters that, that we computed at that V sub R tornado time. And you can see that um, the, um, the linear cases had a, a, a quite a bit lower um, by two, two tenths of a nautical mile diameter than uh, in the median than the supercell cases. And overall, the, the, the low top or mini supercells had the smallest diameters uh, and the, the linear just a, a little bit um, a little bit broader mesocycle or mesovortex. So I took all the uh, V sub R magnitudes or, uh, at uh, the nearest tornado time and, and, and put together a scatter plot um, by range. And what you see here is, is a, a huge range ranging from just over or 10 knots all the way up to this one that's at 75 knots. But there appears to be a clustering there between um, 20 and, and 40 knots where a, a large number or a majority of the cases show up. And again, I think the key thing is here is there's, there's quite a range there between um, 20 and 40 knots where all these cases uh, fall for the unwarned events. For the unwarned events with a TDS, um, there was a TDS present in 32% of the cases. And I should make a, a note here about the TDS. We looked for the 15 minute period after the, the, the tornado time to see if a TDS was present. If this was a longer lived tornado, we didn't go beyond 50, 15 minutes. So if it was a long lived tornado and it ended up producing a, a, a TDS um, 15 minutes after the tornado actually touched down, that, that wouldn't be reflected in this. Um, there was 108 um, TDSs present in the, this uh, more robust 340 tornado uh, data set. Uh, so that's 32% of the cases. And uh, the majority of the TDSs uh, occurred with tornadoes that were rated EF1. If we actually look at that, breaking it down a little bit further, what we see is the, um, is the tornado strength or the rating increase um, the odds of a TDS also increased with um, the F1s, 39% um, of them, that was a TDS, the F2s, 58%, and the, the only one EF3 uh, in the case in the database, um, that was a TDS observed with that. So the probability, again, of a TDS increased is the tornado warning, or is the tornado intensity increased. This was a geographical distribution of those 108 TDSs. And what you, you see here is, is that land cover, um, and I think that, that's pretty much a, a known commodity with TDSs, uh, appears to be a, a, a strong contributor into whether or not you're going to see a TDS a lot of the time. And as you get into the um, mid-Mississippi Valley and, and or the Mississippi Valley, Great Lakes, and Ohio Valley region where the, the land cover is significantly different than the plains, um, that you're more likely to see a TDS, especially as the intensity of the tornado increases. The last thing that we looked at as far as the radar attributes was whether or not there was a merger, and this would have been in the 15 minutes prior to tornado genesis. And a merger was observed in, in uh, roughly one-fifth of the cases, or 73 of the 340. Um, of the cases that um, we saw a merger, um, most were associated with the tornado, which produced EF1 damage. Um, and most of the mergers, just by a small majority, occurred with linear modes. The last thing, sales usage. Um, sales was introduced in, in the first half of 2014. And so sales usage um, for the cases, the unworn cases, um, there was only 83 cases that we saw that sales was on, but a, a lot of that could be the yeah. fact that just sales wasn't available at that time period. Mm -hmm. However, a, a good note is as we got into 2015, for virtually um, a, a large percentage, 91% of the 2015 uh, sales was uh, turned on, and um, it might not necessarily always ha have been in, in, in the right strategy as, as far as sales uses versus one, two, or three, but it, it was being used. So that, that, that's a positive thing. So looking at, at all this data, there, there's a lot of different ways you can interpret it. So I'm just gonna throw out some of what I thought were my key findings. 
Um, some of them are, are, are pretty straightforward. The majority of these unwarned tornadoes were weak, short-lived, and narrow. Again, that's a, a good thing. Um, most of the events occurred during the late spring or early summer, during the late afternoon or early evening. Again, I don't think there's anything really earth-shattering there. We didn't see a, a, a strong peak in uh, the overnight hours or anything like that that, that you might worry about um, as far as maybe situational awareness. Um, the one thing that might might have stuck out a little bit was the the presence or a lack of a convective watch it may have been a factor in some cases. Um, there was no watch in effect for over half the cases when there was the unwarned tornado was the first or the only tornado of the uh, of the day. Um, the linear modes dominated the unwarned tornado events within the, Miss mid, uh, the Mississippi Valley, Ohio Valley, Great Lakes region, uh, while supercells dominated uh, the region of the Great Plains. Tornadoes rated EF1 were the most frequently observed unwarned tornadoes produced by the linear modes, whereas um, the EF0 tornado uh, rated tornadoes dominated the unwarned tornadoes produced by supercell modes. And um, for the unorganized modes, virtually um, the vast majority were rated EF0. Looking at the statistics as far as radar range, um, radar range doesn't appear to significantly impact the lack of warning in most cases. 75% um, of the cases were uh, less than or uh, equal to 60 nautical miles from the nearest radar. Now that doesn't mean that uh, the best radar was being used in all cases, and you know, we certainly couldn't, couldn't sample that. Um, but it, it, it goes without saying that you should always be using the, the, the best and closest radar to the event or the one that has the best viewing angle when you're when you're looking at any storm that has tornadic or any kind of severe weather potential. Um, looking at the uh, visa bar um, values and normalized rotation magnitudes observed with the unwarned tornadoes, we saw that there was a wide range of, of, of magnitudes observed with observed with these unwarned tornadoes. Uh, it seemed like the majority of the unwarned tornadoes for all the organized modes occurred with visa bar values between 20 and 40 knots and normalized rotation values between um, 0.5 and 1.25. Uh, Again, a, a pretty big range. So thinking about the visa bar values of less than 25 knots, um, perhaps tornadoes are occurring at lower visa bar values um, than we normally associate with a, a potentially tornadic circulation. Um, the unwarned tornadoes with visa bar values greater than 50 knots is a bit puzzling. Um, by any measure, that's a, it's a pretty strong circulation. Um, again, it, there's no way to, to know when those values existed, what was the factor that went into the unwarned tornado. Um, collectively, if you look to normalize rotation and the visa bar magnitudes, they were increasing prior and up to the tornado time. But, you know, collectively looking at all these these, these things I've just stated in the data sets, there's no specific uh, rotational velocity or normalized, ro ro normalized rotation magnitude uh, that is a fail-safe indicator of tornado genesis. We're seeing tornadoes that occur with a, a wide range of, of values. So, um, v sub R and normalized rotation are, are best used to evaluate and identify trends in the mesocyclone or mesovortex strength in an organization. Um, another product that can also help in that assessment is the uh, multi-radar, uh, multi-sensor uh, azimuthal shear and rotation tracks. Um, the majority of the unwarned tornadoes occurred with uh, mesocyclone or mesovortex diameters less than two nautical miles. Uh, the tightest diameters were with the linear modes in the low top or mini supercells. Um, the probability of a TDS increase as the tornado intensity increased. Um, land cover appears to be a major factor in the presence of a TDS and um, should go without saying that cell mergers should be monitored closely in any kind of warning situation. So I'm done with my portion and I will turn it over to Rod and let him take over. Hopefully I'm doing this. Okay, thanks Fred. Um, I'll just do a quick test here. I'm not quite sure. Let's make sure we get the screen switched over here quick.
Okay, so Fred went through mostly the tornado and radar attributes. I'll be covering um, some of these other sections. Now, the first thing we have is uh, looking at some of the NWSCR verification statistics from 2014 and 2015. There were 631 unwarned tornado events now. As Fred mentioned, those are segmented, based, county-based. So, um, you know, when we whittle down our events, is down in the 400s. Um, in addition, 174 of those were partially warned events. And if you look at the EF scales, um, pretty much you can see as EF intensity increased, our skill increased with it. Now, as you, Fred is talking, we only had one unwarned EF3 in the database and did not have an EF4. Um, we did have some partial warned events with those, but also re remember as well that the entire tornado track is identified by the highest EF scale rating. And so, you know, a lot of these partial unwarned areas were much weaker at the time before they hit their max intensity. So one of the issues we had going through this database was storm data quality. And it took us a long time going through all this data to actually weed out a lot of the storm data issues that we found. Um, as you can see, we did find 29 of our unwarned tornadoes were actually warned. Um, that's 6.3% of our unwarned tornadoes were actually warned. Now think about how those impacts of POD, false alarm, CSI. In addition, 36 more tornadoes, in addition to the 29 above, had incorrect times and or placement errors. So you add up that 36 and 29, we had 65 total errors in storm data, or 14% of our reports had errors in them. So that... that Really, that's kind of astounding to us that we had that many errors. And, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can fix these errors. Um, a lot of them, the time errors were often one to two hours. Uh, storm data entry does require CST. That's potentially that maybe some of these entries are getting put in as CDT. Uh, we did have numerous events with a TDS prior to the storm data start time. At times, TDSs were also noted with no storm data. And then finally, um, Part of our TWIP team, while it's a little bit outside of our realm, we are going to be working on um, with some local experts on storm data entry best practices. Um, all storm data entry certainly need to undergo a rigorous QC process. And really don't think, you know, tornadoes are our gipper goals. Most offices are 50 tornadoes are under. It shouldn't be that strenuous an exercise to go through the radar data again. You know, make sure these reports are correct because this is what we're being verified on. This is what Congress is seeing. So some of the unwarned tornado findings and, and uh, examples, this is one example, uh, the, that dot within the yellow circle, you can see is two hours off, 75 nautical miles from the storm. The storm's off to the southwest with the confirmed tornado warning on it at that point. And then this is two hours later, you can see a tornado warning is out. So this tornado warning actually went unverified. Um, it also had, the storm was on the ground for 25 minutes, and if everybody recalls how storm data works, uh, tornado war tornadoes are verified per minute. So that's 25 unwarned minutes that occurred with this storm. Um, in addition, so that's the end point when it ends 25 minutes later. So that entire track went unwarned per storm data, even though it was actually inside of a warning. And that's a huge hit to to our statistics with that that event. In addition, we had a second tornado that occurred within these, that warning and, and a second warning that was issued. That was on the ground for nine more minutes. So in total, we had 34 minutes of unwarned tornado warnings due to two hour errors and storm data. Another error, incorrect locations. Uh, the one off to the left with the yellow circle. Uh, potentially the LSR is the icon and the tornado icon. And then there's a red dot off to the northwest of that. That's actually the storm data entry point. Um, this very well could be due to spotter location being entered and then not QC'd when it was entered into storm data. Now, all of these, we went through um, numerous hours of, of storms to make sure these didn't occur with other storms. And this one certainly didn't. Everything remained off to the east with it. Another one, um, this is another event, and we'll see some more examples of this event a little bit later on, but you can see right now at this point, we have a tornado warning out. Um, there is a, if you look at the more, very lower right and then the ZDR to the lower left, we do have a TDS on the storm. And on the notice, the lowering CC to the north of that's all within the inflow region, so that's not the TDS, it's that little bit that's catching the northeast corner of that. So that tornado warning would actually, would have verified 
And this storm will move off to the northeast, and we'll see what occurred with that a little bit later on. So some other factors for unwarned events. And, you know, it looks like, you know, we're going through all these unwarned events and factors. Now, one thing to point out is we don't know exactly what was going on in the offices at this time. You know, what were you getting reports, et cetera. The only thing we can see is what we see in the radar data and with the reports that occurred. So, um, you know, we, we don't know the, the entire picture of what was going on with all these events. But as Fred mentioned, we did have bad data due to range folding, which was 3.1% of our unwarned cases. You know, was that due to adaptive PRF issues? You know, are we in office monitoring, making sure that we are adjusting our PRF to make sure that it's um, correct and that we have the best viewing possible with our radar data? You know, are we using a, a surrounding offices radar? If so, and if they're not busy, maybe we can have them adjust and get better uh, data quality with it. Also, there's uh, several with the aliasing issues on scans prior to the tornado. Uh, we did notice VCP and sales settings were not optimal during on numerous occasions. You know, make sure, you know, we did have a TWIP, TWIP recommendation last year that was sales two at a minimum, especially for tornadic cases. And really, we recommend three, sales three. Um, you know, get as much data as possible, you know, so we can see these rapidly developing situations. And a lot of these EF zeros and ES ones did did develop pretty quickly. So some other observations, you know, do our warning meteorologists struggle to identify TDSs in real time? Now, I, I think some of this might go back to the whole fire hose of data that we have. You know, are we optimally looking at our data? How's our D2D set up, especially since we've gone to the two panel? You know, are we properly integrating dual pole data at this time. You know, that's something as a TWIP team we're going to be looking at as far as maybe having some recommended um, displays for these uh, warning operations. You know, do we need six panels or nine panels? You know, a good six panel might be uh, reflectivity, SRM, uh, rotational tracks. You can have our ZDR, KDP, and correlation coefficient if you're in tornado, tornado mode. Um, warning meteorology so you know there, there's a lot of things we can look at there uh significant differences between local radar data and the neighboring radar you know are we look are we looking at our neighbor's radar are, you know are we looking at mrms data etc to take uh, advantage of the multiple radars multiple sensor um, data that we have rotational rotation looks a lot better at 0 0.9 on the loft and shows up at then it shows up at 0 0.5 you know are we we've had numerous uh tornadoes that come close to the rda and you know I think as the longer warning meteorologists are on, as a warning meteorologist radar, you know, they've been on for several hours, they're, they may not be starting to look, they're starting to wear down, not looking at as much data. Maybe they start just focusing at the 0 0.5 data, they're falling behind and don't aren't seeing the 0 0.9 and above. So, you know, that might be the case. We had additional tornado warnings that were not reissued with, hist with storms with history of producing tornadoes. In addition, we had some unworn segments due to gaps between polygons with the inner office and uh, polygons and at CWA and county borders as well. So we have, you know, we're not quite reaching to the borders and these tornadoes are uh, moving across those gaps. So while the public may be properly warned, I guess verification wise, it's we're taking hits on these. So some other observations also, you know, obviously land spots are difficult to, to detect. There was a TWIP memo set on land spots last year. You know, you know, there's certainly some debate, should these be included in our Gipper goals for tornadoes because they're really difficult for us to get. Uh, tornadoes do occur in poor storm environments and unfavorable near, or poor storm structure and unfavorable near storm environments. So there's just some cases, it's just gonna be very difficult for us to get warnings out. Uh, you know, the radar 0 0.5 degree beam height may overshoot primary features and this may be more of a case for, our, you know, our Western uh, central region region where there's just not as many RDAs in the area. And the tornado warnings are issued, but a tornado occurred just outside the polygon. So maybe our polygonology wasn't quite, quite optimal for that event. So as you mentioned, so we have some gaps between warnings. This is uh, one where we had a storm moving from the northwest to the southeast, northwest flow. Um, we had a, a warning with observed tornado tag in it. And then we had a basically a one nautical mile gap that the tornado moved through during that time and then into the next warning. This is a very zoomed in. This is, I'm not sure if you can see the green line 
right in here, but we have two warnings here actually, a CWA to the north, CWA to the south. Tornado occurs, but moves right through that gap and both CWAs take a hit on a tornado moving through the gap. This one had, the southern CWA had a gap of a little over one nautical mile. C CWA to the north had a gap of around a half mile or I believe it might even been 0.3 nautical miles. So storm moved right through the gap. So make sure, you know, your polygons reach your CWA boundaries. Make sure they go to the county boundaries if that's what you're using, um, especially along the CWA borders. We had another one, IBW tag, confirm tag issues potentially. You know, are we properly identifying the TDSs again? So this was actually an unwarned tornado that came in from the west. Um, a tornado warning was issued after the TDS was apparent, and then we did not update. Uh, the storm remained on the, the tornado remained on the ground for at least several minutes, and we did not update our tornado to confirm tag, at least based on radar. And we actually did end up having another tornado to the southeast of this as well. So, you know, continue to, you know, you got to be diligent monitoring all your data that's available, certainly. And I, I know that dual pole data is certainly new, and we're still trying to figure out our fire hose of data and how to properly analyze it all. Um, this is the, the storm that I mentioned earlier. So we, here we are moving out of our tornado warning. Um, at this point, as we talked about, storm with history of tornado, though I'm not sure it was known in the office at that time, moved to the northeast and notice our TDS became much greater at this time as it moved to the northeast. Now we do have another CWA that's just off to the east. Um, and we'll take a look at what they're seeing at this time. But again, no warning, and at this time, it's still not in storm data. It won't be in storm data until about the next volume scan We're at, at that location. Um, this is the other CWA. So the other one, just looking here, was 30 nautical miles and about 2,200 feet aloft. And as we move to the other CWA, it's 98 nautical miles away and a little over 12,000 feet. So you can see, you know, really can't distinguish TDS. You know, our rotation's not great, at least at that level. It's certainly much more low, low level. It's shown up much better. And even a reflectivity and hook is not apparent at that point either. So, you know, are we, did, were we watching the other um, CWA? Were we talking to each other, um, coordinating, et cetera? And this one moved across as well with uh, no warning at that time. Um, range folding, this wasn't the best storm structure example, but this was an example of a tornado that occurred within um, an area of range folding. So again, if you're range folded, no other storms that you need to worry about are certainly in that area. That's your storm of focus. You know, we can adjust the PRF. Don't always uh, wait for the um, 212 auto PRF to, to unmask what may be going on. Okay, so now we've looked at all that. We're going to go into the near storm environment overview, and it's got, I'm gonna, I've got a pretty abbreviated version. I'm going to be pretty much focusing on what occurred um, it's with the parameters that focus in the, the uh, SIG TOR parameter and especially the effective SIG TOR. We're going to be using basically the SPC meso-analysis data that Thompson um, et al. in 2012 used and we're going to be doing some comparisons with that as well. We did gather data for 30 near storm environment parameters. Uh, we're only going to look at a very small subset at this time. Uh, the near storm environment data was sampled at a point of initial tornado touchdown. Now remember we went through and redid a lot of these uh, so some of those errors we mentioned in the storm data we redid those so we could get them all into our database uh, near storm data also sampled in pure storm environments so if it occurred at 2223z example we use a 22z data this is a total so i was able to pull uh, near storm environment data from 396 cases and you can see the breakdown again as what uh, fred showed the supercells and qlcs is certainly were the big uh, big storm types that occurred in addition we did at the multi-cell cluster bull echoes and low level low top supercells um, also and then as we get down into more single cell and multi-cell if we try to get into some of these box and whisker plots they're much more messy certainly and um, i was dealing with excel so my graphics aren't as pretty as fred's but um, you can kind of get the gist of what occurred with this so for the mixed layer lcl unwarned events uh supercell Really, you can see everything's, the median certainly are well below 1,000 meters. Now, we do have some cases where there was a supercell that had a LCL over 2,200 feet. Um, didn't look at that case in particular yet. But 
in general, you can see low top supercells and QLCS is their mean median LCLs are well below 750 meters. So we tend to have very low cloud bases with these. Now comparisons, the supercell to the Thompson 2012 right mover EF0, you can see your LCLs is lower. Now again, I should uh, also put the disclaimer in there. We did merge all the CR data together. So maybe some of our Western Plains uh, folks out there um, you know, the Dodge cities and the Goodlands and maybe out farther to Boulder, maybe some of your LCLs tend to be higher out there as we get into more of the golf moisture and into the plains and we start going more HP supercell. And um, we did at this point merge all HPs and supercells together. Um, our LCLs tend to be quite a bit lower. So um, that'll be something on our to-do list is uh, geo geographic distribution. But overall, the supercells, uh, quite favorable actually to the right mover EF2s um, LCLs in the Thompson 2012 and certainly much lower than the no tours and the right movers. QLCS again uh, really favorable compared to the Thompson 2012 QLCS tornado events and certainly much lower than the QLCS uh, no tour events uh, Thompson 2012. Looking at zero one kilometer bulk wind difference or bulk shear um, Generally, everything had at least the supercells, QLCS, and Boecos um, were 20 knot. The medians were 20 knots or higher with those, and tend to have a little bit lower shear. And I, main thing I put on land spouts is more for comedy relief. If you really want to see, obviously, their low shear tend to be more of a zero to three kilometer cape uh, stretching type events. But you can see they're really a much lower shear type environments with those. Um, comparing the supercells again, um, compared favorably to the right mover um, Thompson 2012 tornadoes, and certainly higher than the right mover no tornadoes um, Thompson 2012. QLCS again, it's median around 33 knots, compared quite favorably to the QLCS Thompson 2012, and again much higher than the no tornado Thompson 2012. Uh, zero three kilometer bulk shear now, you know we. We have eight QLCS modules coming out, and that's going to be looking at the uh, zero three kilometer line normal shear. Now we haven't looked at that, um, but overall, you can see the QLCS is uh, at least the bulk shear is around thirty nine knots for a median. With that, and I believe a lot of the line normal shear was certainly greater than thirty knots on a lot of those occasions. And supercells are certainly, um, you know, generally all our unwarned events were thirty knots of uh, zero three kilometer bulk shear, and then there's our land spouts lagging back and then for effective shear i didn't i don't have the i use that because it tends to do better especially with uh overrunning over cold domes etc with that and tends to block out that compared to zero to one kilometer shear but you know supercells around 200 meters square per second squared are qlcs is very similar boacos tend to be a little bit higher shear environments for the effective shear and then and MC line, MC cluster, just really not enough events to really get a good data set on those overall. Effective SRH for supercells, again, around to maybe just below the right mover Thompson 2012 median and certainly higher than the right mover no tour. And QLCS, again, um, kind of general theme, uh, really compares favorable to the Thompson 2012 at around 225 meters squared per second squared, and then quite a bit higher than the median up around 100 on the QLCS, QLCS no tour, Thompson 2012. On effective SIG tour, now overall, you you know, when you expect really high values, you get tornadoes, well, it's not really the case. At least in our unwarned events, these are all really pretty low on the effective SIG tour, so maybe that's having some impact. And we're looking at, we've looked at the individual parameters earlier, now maybe, there's something in there that maybe even a little bit, maybe gave some of the, the uh, warning meter out some reason to not issue warnings. Maybe there's a parameter, maybe the LCL is a little higher, but the effective shear was high, was um, a little bit, you know, more favorable. So maybe we had unfavorable events, parameters in there that may have been a reason that we've been holding back. Um, but you can see overall the effective SIG tours were relatively low, um, generally one and a half and lower. And QLCS certainly, especially since those are evening and overnight events, they're not, I think the SPC mesal analysis tends to underdo some of the ML cape and zero to three kilometer cape, et cetera, and maybe has a little higher sin in those. And you can see those events are much lower for the effective SIG tours.
And that's just the same graphic, but uh, slimmed down. And then comparing two tops in 2012, um, the Supercell, if you look at the EF1, it compares, compares favorably to the tops in 2012 EF1. Um, and then QLCS, it, tops in 2012 didn't have it broken down for Supercell and QLCS, but QLCS is again much lower than even the EF1, EF0 tops in 2012. So a few fat stats of note, 60.7% um, of unwarned tornadoes occurred with a SIG tour, effective SIG tour less than one, excluding, these are all gonna be excluding the boundary layers, lands, spouts, and singles. 43% uh, were super set, or of the super cells were less than one and 73% of the QLCSs were less than one. 71% of the unwarned tornadoes occurred with a LCL less than 1,000 meters. 62% um, super cells had, were under that domain. And 82% of the QLCS has occurred with a LCL less than 1,000 meters. And then finally, 59% of unwarned tornadoes occurred with an effective SRH uh, greater than 150 meters squared per second squared. Now, the supercell and QLCS and actually the bow echoes were higher than that. Whoops, sorry. At uh, 62% for supercells and 67% for QLCSs. Some of the other storm types were actually lower than that, and that drug that average down. So some key findings. So we reviewed several parameters that included the SIG TOR calculation compared to the Thompson 2012. Um, overall, the supercells were um, compared favorably to the Thompson 2012 supercell EF0s and EF1 results. And it would help if I could not have a spelling error there. Um, also, the QLCS's unwarned tornadoes actually occurred in more favorable environments than what Thompson 2012 QLCS tornado environment showed. So finally, some potential future work uh, separating the near storm environment and radar attribute data into geographic locations and regions. You know, as Fred showed and we've shown here is certainly as you get to the mid Missouri and Miss Mississippi Valley and eastward, especially as getting into more of the Gulf moisture, I think uh, certainly a near storm environment parameters can be different and certainly radar signatures could be different as well as we're dealing with different storm modes. Um, comparing you know, individual parameters such as effective estuaration, um, LCLs, and et cetera, and maybe even looking at some individual events to see why, if there is something that's sticking out that may have uh, led to un uh, an unmoored event. Also comparing the radar analysis data to the near storm data. So we could even look at VROT and compare it to uh, the effective SRH and see if there's any comparisons there. Maybe there may be as well. And then finally, uh, this may take some time um, but possibly we could add some data after 2015. This was a huge uh, undertaking um, by the entire team that we had, and I'll show the team here in a moment, but it, it took a lot of time to go through this, certainly. So it's, that may be something we can get to in the future, but uh, certainly won't be occurring over the next year with that. And certainly we want to acknowledge uh, several of those that helped us contribute to this event because we wouldn't be able to do it with, by ourselves at all. So Jake Bailick, Aaron Johnson, Ray Wolf, Craig Kogel, Kevin Deitch, Alex Gibbs, and big thank you to Andrew Dean for providing the SPC mesoanalysis analysis data. And I should actually mention Tom Holtquist, who gave me the program to run through the uh, mesoanalysis analysis data quickly, so I didn't have to go through and pinpoint it all with it. So um, that is our pre presentation. Thank you for all attending, and uh, I, we may have a qu few minutes for some questions. Oh, yeah, if you want to raise your hand or uh, type a question in, um, I'll be glad to help monitor um, anybody's questions. Uh, I'm going to unmute William here. William, go ahead. Latham, is it Le Or Bill, maybe is it Bill? All right, um, for whatever reason, we can't catch his uh, question. And Fred and Rod, I don't see anybody else with any other questions. Oh, 
they're trying, but for whatever reason, they can't pick up. You want to go ahead and type it into the question area? Yeah, it's certainly Fred and I are, I think everybody's probably got our email addresses too. If you're having trouble getting questions in here, certainly shoot us an email. Um, we'll be glad to chat to you. All right. With that, I don't see any other questions. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Fred and Ron. Okay, thank you. Thank you.